Uh, first of all, Wilfred, Emmanuel Jones, I would like to first of all thank you for sparing your time with me. I know you're an extremely busy man, so I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity and the time to really speak to me and come on Let's Do Humans podcast and share your story. Um, today's quite intriguing for myself on a personal level because there's, um, th- there's two things that's happening today that's never happened before. First of all, you're the first guest that we've ever had that has an official blue tick on Twitter. So that's the first for Let's that Do Humans a, podcast. A, a official what, sorry? Blue tick on Twitter, which means that you've been officiated. You're an official Twitter user. All right. So you've been recognised. I'm not sure if you knew that yourself. What does that actually mean then? Oh, so it's only, it's only celebrities or well-known individuals that receive it from Twitter. So when oh, you're right. recognised by Twitter as being someone of inspiration or someone that's offered something to the community or done something of purpose, okay. they give you a blue tick. So I'm a blue tick. Yeah, you see, official. You, you're well, I tell you, that, that's good news to me. I'm going to go and spread the word that we're, we have an official blue yeah. tick. I'm surprised you didn't actually know that yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't oh, well. know that at all. I'm not as up as I should be, really, with all yeah. of this sort of social media. But oh, well, 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 you're, telling me, you're telling me it's a good thing. It's then. a very good thing, yeah. Okay. So it's three first day today. So, um, yeah. so the first first is me first time meeting someone with a blue tick. Okay. You noticing that you've got a blue tick for the first time <laughs> and recognising it. Yes. And then the third thing is the first time I've actually met a black farmer who's based in the UK. Well, that is definitely um, a first because yeah. um, I must say I haven't met any at all. Yeah. So um, we seem to be um, very low in numbers yeah. here in the UK. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So how, how did that come about? If you don't mind just sharing your story briefly with us. Um, well, j- just to go back, mm-hmm. really, um, I was born in Jamaica okay, and amazing. I was born in a place called um, Frankville Clarendon, which is country. So yes. if, you, if you went there today, yeah. it's farm country. They, yeah. they, they still grow stuff there. And um, my parents came over to this country in mm. the um, 1950s. Yeah. And so you're in Windrush. Windrush. I'm, yeah. I'm of the Windrush generation. Oh, in amazing. fact, I'm, I am one of those people who would have been sent back home yeah. if I hadn't renewed my passport. Um, and the reason why, because I came over on a one of the blue um, British and Commonwealth passports. Oh, okay. And I, I remember I had to become nationalised as a British person mm. to get a British passport, which I did many, many years ago. Yeah. And the reason why I did that is because I used to travel a lot. So I understand very much that... Um, the people who came over at that time as children who probably didn't do much traveling mm-hmm. suddenly got to an age and discovered, oh, the law had changed yeah, and yeah. passed them by. Mm-hmm. And they suddenly found that, you know, after spending so many years in this country, they didn't um, belong here. So I'm of that generation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, as you know, people like my parents came to this country in the 50s yeah. um, and they in my parents case they went to live in Birmingham mm-hmm. and the important thing I like to tell people is this what we should remember as black people mm-hmm. is that um, to be here in this country in the first place is a demonstration that our parents were entrepreneurial. Yes. It's a very entrepreneurial thing. The risk takers weren't they? Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it's very, very entrepreneurial to leave your country of mm-hmm. origin, leave everything that you know, all your friends, all your anchors of survival, to leave that behind, to go to a foreign country mm-hmm. to advance your life and not just your life, but the life of your children. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we remind the second and the third generation who were born in this country that they are different because their parents were entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs are people who are prepared to break the mode and do something differently. Most definitely. You know, in, 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 in the 50s, like all people, all foreigners, all migrants, when they come to a new country, you know, get treated like shit, basically. Yeah. Whether that's Irish, Polish, um, Caribbean, you know, we had our our, our, our our challenges during the 50s and 60s. And um, I was brought up in a place called Small Heath in Birmingham. Oh, yes, heard of it, yeah. Yeah, and it's one of those classic poor <laughs> inner city areas, yeah. you know. Before we came there, it was the Irish, then us, and then it was the Bangladeshi. So it's just one of those cheap housing um, areas and it's one of those areas that is sort of devoid of hope opportunity mm-hmm. and um, 
in my case, um, my there's eleven of us in my family. Oh wow! And all living together. All living together in a terrace house. So there's oh, wow. you know it's very very small. Yeah. I was brought up three to a bed. Um, not only three to a bed, but I know what it was like to be was hungry. Head to toe. Head to toe. <laughs> yeah. It was you know it was tough, and mm. um, I knew what it was like to go hungry. Mm. My my mother had to try and feed eleven people on one chicken, wow. and so you know I even to this day I have a a bone fetish because you had to chew this <laughs> bone. <laughs> what did you start the membrane? Isn't it? <laughs> it chews every bit of nutrition from this yeah. bone because um, you know we was always quite hungry. Now, mm. <clears throat> as a way of supplementing the family income, my father had an allotment. That's amazing, and it was my job as the oldest boy to look after this allotment. Mm -hmm. And this allotment really became my oasis away from the misery of living in a place like Small Heath. And uh, I loved it so much that I can remember making a promise to myself at the age of 11 that one day I would like to own my own farm. Uh, and, uh, so even at that young tender age, you decided that you wanted to be a farmer? At the age of 11, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. Mm. But it was a promise that I had uh, made to myself. And then everything that I subsequently did with my life mm -hmm. was to try and get into a position to, to buy, buy this farm. Yeah. And it took me some 35 years or so, 30, yeah, 35 years mm -hmm. to, to get into a position to buy this farm. But one of the things I like to say to young people is, look, you know, mm -hmm. Dream early because yeah. it takes a long time to actually achieve your yeah, dreams. To manifest, yeah, yes, yeah. definitely. But that, that's it's, it's interesting you say that because we live in an age whereby we kind of live in a micro microwave age where everyone wants of success instantly and they want their dreams and achievements to happen instantly and a really young age as well so it's understanding the true nature of success that it takes long it's a it's a gradual process to get to where you need to get to eventually but as long as you have that dream and the purpose there from a young age you can cont you can work towards it and achieve it in the end well know. what i believe one of the great messages i give to people is this I believe you only need two things to achieve anything you want in life. Which is? It doesn't matter the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter on your education. It doesn't matter on your background. You need two things to achieve any success. And any successful person will have these two things. Mm -hmm. And this is what young people need to realize in terms of being successful. Because yeah. you're right, they, they want instant glory. But these are the two things that you want. The first thing is that you need to be ruthlessly focused okay. absolutely focused and any successful person is very good at focusing they just get rid of the white noise of mm. everyday living they don't get distracted by what other people are doing what other people want or what other people say they're focused in what mm. they want to do that's the first thing but the most important thing the second and most important thing is that you need to have passion that's now the reason why passion is so important is because passion defies reason, mm -hmm. logic. Um, it actually helps you get over all of the hurdles that life throws at you. Yeah. And it makes the impossible possible. That is what passion does. Mm -hmm. And I say to people, passion is a bit like falling in love. Yeah. You know when you fall in love? Yeah. It just defies all <laughs> it's reason. It's the butterfly effect. <laughs> yeah. It defies yeah. all reason, mm -hmm. all sense. And somehow you're just mm -hmm. driven. So if people want to know what A, what it's like to be an entrepreneur, B, what it's like to be achieving your thing. It's that feeling where you've got to just keep going. You know, yeah. it doesn't make sense. There's no reason or rationalizing yeah. with it. You just feel compelled to do Most it. Most definitely. Can I ask you one question regarding passion? So would you say passion has to be specific to a, a gift or a skill set or is passion the energy that you put towards anything that you want to achieve? It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific gift that you have bestowed upon yourself. So for instance, does passion have to be me being a great footballer or just me practicing very hard to become a great footballer? Is it naturally innate in you or is it something that you work towards? The big mistake that people make is that, let's say you're the greatest football player out there. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you'll go on to become a, a great football star. Yeah. Because it's about what what's happening, and this is the trouble about our society, mm -hmm. everybody's waiting to be discovered. Yeah. It doesn't happen like that. So if you're a great football player, you got to if, if and it becomes your passion, mm -hmm. well, what you, what you do is that you make that your life. Yeah. 
you, everything that you do, think, breathe, and smell, do it becomes your life, you know. Mm. And then by doing that, that's mm. where the opportunities come. Amazing. Yes. I think what tends to happen in this day and age is people think oh, I could sing, I've got talent, and they sit down just waiting for someone to discover, discover them, you, yeah. and it never happens. Yeah. And there's so many platforms out there now that you to put yourself out there anyway. So there isn't really necessarily an excuse because if you're a singer, you can just jump on YouTube, for instance, and put your music out there instead of you looking for someone wait or waiting for someone to come and um, discover you so well you see the thing is is that yes the problem with all these platforms are all about instant gratification mm -hmm. and so if you want to be um, going for a long time mm -hmm. you just cannot rely on these what I call instant gratification models mm -hmm. um, it's going out, you know, on the road, meeting your audience, doing things. Do not just rely on um, stuff that is online because it's only one aspect yeah. of what you need to do in connecting with people. Yeah. The best way of connecting with people is to actually meet them. Most definitely. And one of the problems of today's society is that young people are using the skill to connect with people face to face. Mm. People are frightened of picking up the phone and having conversations. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Everything is done online and I'm telling you, people mm -hmm. are gonna suffer as a consequence for that. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because exactly what you just mentioned is, is um, it's actually the reason behind the name of my podcast. So the podcast is called Let's Do Humans. So it's about communication between human beings, having a dialogue directly face to face, not over the phone or over Skype. It's actually meeting the individual, sitting down with them, having a dialogue and then getting to understand and learning on the way. Because I, I struggled with education throughout school and that's the reason why I do the podcast now because I realized that I'm able to learn better in this type of environment where I'm actually having a discourse with you directly instead of over some platform where I can't see you or interact with you as a human being. So it's amazing that you said that, that we actually lose Well, what I think is that. really interesting, um, and it's one of the subjects I'm, I'm really passionate about, that those of us of our age, mm. we would talk, go to school, get a good education. If you get a good education, that will then set you up for a job for life. Mm. For those of us who are either dyslexic or weren't very good in terms of the educational system, mm. we were at a disadvantage. Mm. And so the people who have prospered in the past um, are people who had the, br the sort of brain that was ideal for the information age. Yeah. They're fundamentally human computers. Mm -hmm. So that's you know accountants, uh, doctors, barristers, um, solicitors. All of those are what they call left brain um, functions. So if you've got a really evolved, um, strong capacity of your left brain, mm -hmm. you'll be really good in those areas. And that's what we call intelligence. Now, mm -hmm. the big challenge, and you're starting to see it happen now, the big challenge is that all of those people that spent years getting an education, getting to a certain standard, those jobs, those yeah. professions could either be done by a computer. Yeah, they'd be automated, yeah. Or they'd be automated. Mm -hmm. Now, those people are going to find themselves in desperate trouble. So we went through the industrial age where all of the, 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 the manual workers, you know, Thatcherism and all that, mm -hmm. they lost their jobs and the working classes have to find new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen with the middle classes. Oh, wow. So the future is going to be those of us who have more right brain talents, those who are not necessarily good at formal education, mm -hmm. um, but what they have is they're quite creative, they think outside of the box. Yeah, they have to adapt they, as well. I find, they, yeah. So they ha it's what they call, we're going from the informational age into mm -hmm. the conceptual age. And the conceptual age is where you could defy logic. You know, you're, you're happy in the space where you don't need to be following all these rules yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. So, it's going to be really interesting mm. the future for those people who have what they call evolved right brain um, skills. And that will be like connecting with people. Yeah. Because by connecting with people, you have to learn skills of how to interact with them, how to read them, how to, you know, mm. how to get on. Now, a computer can't tell you that sort no. of stuff. Computer's quite rigid, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, a computer says yes yeah. or no. Yeah. If, you answer, yeah, if you answer mm. no to a question, mm. you know, that's what the computer thinks is true. But as a human being, Mm. you might be able to read behind that and yeah. think, actually, there's more to this. Yeah. Those are the skills of the future. Amazing, amazing. Um, going back to your story, um, so tell me about the black farmer. The name in itself is very interesting. So well, yeah, so what happened was that, you know, I, I could tell you a long story about how it took me to get to the place mm. of 
um, getting to mm. buy my farm, and I, you know, went through many. Um, <clears throat> I went on many journeys, but I eventually was able to buy my farm um, about 15 years ago. Oh, amazing! Where was Actually, that? longer than that, 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, I used to go down to Devon on holiday, mm. and uh, so I decided I was going to buy a farm in um, in Devon. And uh, what I um, decided when I bought this farm, it was a dairy farm. I thought, well, I'm going to do, um, do it up. Mm -hmm. And then um, what I then realized was that there's a real big gap between urban and rural Britain. Okay. So it's like going to a different country. Yes, yes. Is, uh, I still feel that way. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so what you find is that um, black people especially, they go down there. I had black people saying to me, when I was buying my farm, but mm. why? Why are you buying a farm? Don't they lynch black people down there? <laughs> you know, there is this perception that yeah. it, it is backward, and yeah. that you know these people are unsophisticated. Yeah. But in my experience, mm -hmm. there it is far more friendly. You're treated far more as human beings in that environment than you are in mm. the urban space. Yeah. I think in the urban space, people talk the talk, mm. but they do shit, really. You yeah. know, you, 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 one of the things I find absolutely staggering mm -hmm. is that when I go into big, well-known companies into their head office and you do not see any black people at all, yeah. and if you do, there'll be security, and you just think, man, you know, there's still a long way to sort of go. go yeah. So rather than condemning the rural community for being um, behind the times, I find far more help and friendliness down there than I do up in an urban centre. Okay, Anyhow, yeah. I bought this. I decided. Look, there's this gap between urban and rural Britain, and I've always been a believer that it's outsiders who bring about change. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, there's an opportunity here to create a brand, yeah. um, a food brand, will not only just um, appeal to um, uh, the white Britain, but sort of diverse Britain. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, right, I'm going to do something which is quintessentially British. I thought yeah. I'd do a sausage. And then I found a manufacturer that could develop it to my actual recipe. And then I was scratching my head thinking, what the hell am I going to call this brand? Yeah. And then one day it came to me. All of my next door neighbors used to call me the black farmer. <laughs> Because you're black and you're a farmer. <laughs> and I just thought, shit, you know, it's genius. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bloody good brand name. It really is. Yeah. Not only is it a very good brand name, no one else out there can nick the idea. <laughs> so not only could they not nick the idea, but it has an edge to it. Yeah. People are not too sure about whether it's politically correct or not. Mm. You know, in this politically correct age, you know, <clears throat> referring to somebody as uh, to someone's color, yeah. people tend to be a bit nervous about. They get twitchy, don't they? They get very, yeah. very twitchy. Mm -hmm. And um, what? And that's what I'm sort of playing on. Some people just using the word black, they feel makes them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. That's why some people use the word colored. You know, it's not because they're being I'm racist. Call it the colored farmer, are they? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds a, worse calling the colored farmer. Well, you see what it means. Like yeah. Sort of, it makes it more comfortable for a lot of people mm. because, and that people are not sort of intimidated by the word black black yeah and um and so that's why i call it the black farmer and it's in your face yeah. it really is in your face yeah. and not only is it a black farmer but one of the things that i've always found <coughs> disconcerting about mm. britishness is that nine times out of ten britishness is seen as white it's yeah. white and you know mm. back in the day you know and so it's black contribution and black part of society, you, you know, mm. which seem to be invisible. But uh, a brand that is flying the British flag as yeah. a black farmer, it's in your face. And it's saying, look, we're here, we're arrived, yeah. we're, we're, we're part of... But what was the initial reception to that? So when they when the customers went into the stores and saw a brand say, saying black farmer in it, what was the feedback that you received from that initially? Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because... <coughs> Sorry. Because I would, I would assume initially, I mean, they, your black customers will feel fairly comfortable purchasing from you. Well, some it's, did and some didn't. What initially happened is that when I came with an end black farm, I thought, I'll put this out to research. Mm -hmm. And the research came back and says, don't call it the black farm because <laughs> people will be, be offended. Yeah, you might lose clientele. So well. it, it taught me something really important in life. Research would tell you what people are thinking today, mm -hmm. but it will not tell you what people are thinking tomorrow. And that's, that's where amazing. you need to yeah. have vision. Yeah. to believe in what you're doing is right. Yeah. And the biggest mistake people make is they listen to what people are saying today. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. And so what I did is that when I put it out there, it causes intrigue. Mm -hmm. And so any great brand 
And that's what you want to do. You want to cause intrigue. You want people to think, whoa, is this real? You know, people then start yeah. questioning yeah. whether, you know, what, what is all this about? Mm -hmm. So I think it caught, people weren't offended. Well, some people were, actually. <coughs> I, I launched the bacon. This is a true story. Yeah. I launched a black farmer bacon, and part of the strap line was saying, no white bits. <laughs> and uh, some, a customer wrote, wrote, uh, wrote in to say that I was being racist, racist against yeah. white people. And I wrote back and said, no, 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 no. You know, it's because, you know, when people cook bacon sometimes, you've yeah, got, got the white, white bits. bits yeah. Yeah. I wonder how so, that'll go down in today's age, though. About what? No white bits? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That'll explode on Twitter. You might go viral, but not But sure the sure. point is this, is that, you can't live your life based on how people might react to what you do. Most definitely. Yeah. The thing about being authentic is that you it's your truth. Mm. Some people might like it, some people may not. And one of the challenges about living in this political correct society, everybody's trying to, you know, find steer a course through not offending, not upset, upsetting yeah. people, but yeah. You just will do. Yeah. You know, somebody will always find something to win to moan Most about. definitely. Do you find that's restrictive to creativity as well, like the modern well, It's day only day. if you let it be. You know, yeah. I think one of the things that I'm interested in is that as people, you have a choice in life. You have mm -hmm. a choice between whether you want to be yourself or you want to belong. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the problems we have in our society is about people's need to belong. Gang mm -hmm. crime, mm -hmm. gun crime, all of that. It's about young people having a sense of belonging to something. Yeah. Now, you're never, ever going to achieve your own authentic truth if you have this need to belong. Yeah. Because sometimes to achieve your authentic truth, all you have to do is live with being who you are. Most definitely. You know? Yeah. And living your truth. Yeah. That's amazing. So that's, uh, I mean, your, your bravery comes down to, I mean, a lot of it is in relation to your book that you wrote. The, the title itself is, is called um, Jeopardy, which is about like the, the, the fear of loss or harm, the dangers of fear and loss. Can you ex explain a bit more about the book and the title itself? Well, the reason for writing this book is that I know there are thousands, millions of people out there and doing the things they don't want to be yeah. doing. That they're living what I call in survival mode mm -hmm. and they would love to be doing something else. And the thing that stops them from doing that is fear. Yeah. Fear that if they choose to do what they want to do, they're going to end up in the streets. They're yeah. going to, you know, they're not going to have a chance to, to survive. And that is the big difference between me and those people is that people um, and the, our politics, everything mm -hmm. revolves around this, is that people are searching for something which is impossible, which is certainty. People are looking for certainty. Certainty does not exist. Yeah. So what we have to learn to do is learn to how to live with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being an entrepreneur, any business person, our lives is all about living with uncertainty. Yeah. And if you look at this massive political debate between Brexit at the moment that's fundamentally a debate between certainty and uncertainty, uncertainty most definitely. that the politicians are promising people certainty and my my view is this is that the greatest changes that we've uh, we've had in 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 uh, society has been based on uncertainty i mean whether that is you know winston churchill talking about you know all i could do is promise you blood sweat and tears Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Uh, it's about Jesus Christ. It's all about a, a principle, a vision of something different. Yeah. Not knowing, not, not certainty, just saying there can be a different way and we'll be all right. Yeah. It's how to be at one with uncertainty. And so what I try and do um, in, in the book that I've written is to try and give people... Um, um, rules mm -hmm. of, of, of how they can actually walk towards doing the things that they want to do with their lives if they want to do things you know how they could just have the courage to go go ahead and, and, and do that and 
one of the things I also talk about my, in my book um, is that have, have you read it? No, not yet. No, yeah, no okay. I, I, will, I will read it after this. Most okay, definitely. No. Yeah, I, re I read a bit of it. Briefly. A bit of it. Yeah. yeah. No, but one of one of the bits I talk about is cancer. You know, mm -hmm. having cancer and nearly dying. Yeah. And what it actually does is um, help you focus onto what really matters mm -hmm. in your life. And I try and live my life as though I've only got a year to live. Yeah. And the question I would say to everybody, if you had a year to live, would you be doing what you're doing now? Yeah. And if the answer to that is no, yeah. you are not living life to the full. Yeah. And also, one of the things that I talk about is that we, we live in a society which is terrified of failure. Yeah. But you, you don't ever live to your maximum unless you could point to times when you failed. But is that because our failure is so public now, though? It's what, to do with, what is it that's causing <clears throat> that failure? It's nothing to do now. with the fact that it's so public. It's all about, you know, people who um, think that failure is bad. Yeah. Whereas actually failure is good. Yes, yeah, of course the success. Failure is, a, failure is an indication that you're living your life. Mm -hmm. If you look at your life and say, I haven't failed in anything, you are coasting. You're not living. You know, yeah. it's a waste of life. You have to be able to say, yeah, I fucked up on that or I made a real cock up. Because it's only through failure that you learn. Most definitely. And so if you're not prepared to fail, you're not learning. You're mm. standing still. Yeah. And so, again, you, in terms of doing the things that you want to do, it's about actually being at one with failure, being at one with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. All the things that we think are negatives, in fact, are absolute positives. Amazing. Because that's what makes us human. That is what, you know, propels us forward. Every great success has a phenomenal story yeah. of how they got there. And the other thing that I think we need to look at is this. The thing we praise in our society is courage. Everybody mm -hmm. sees some an act of courage and say, wow, that is amazing. just amazing. Yeah. But you cannot get to courage unless you're prepared to go through uncertainty mm -hmm. and vulnerability. Yeah. So the two things that are negative, mm -hmm. uncertainty and vulnerability, yeah. are the two key things you've got to go through to get to courage. Most definitely. And, and it's strange as well when it comes to the whole matter of fear because fear is crippling in itself and it's very dangerous. And one of the best motivational quotes I've ever heard is pretty simple. So there was a gentleman who was speaking to a young entrepreneur and the young entrepreneur told him that he's not motivated. And, and when he does get that momentary time of motivation, he feels like a sense of fear that people are judging him. And then the individual who um, he was speaking to looked in his eyes and just straight up told him, he said, look, you're going to die. At some point, you're going to die. All the people that you're, you're afraid of, all the people that are intimidating you, all the people that are holding you back, they're not going to care when you die. The girlfriend that you have now, if you pass away tomorrow, she's going to find another boyfriend within the next couple of weeks. So what is it truly that is preventing you from being the person you're supposed to be or taking a risk and the opportunity that you're supposed to be taking? So fear is extremely crippling. It's dangerous. But how, how do you overcome it yourself? Do you think it was something that was innately in you or was this? <coughs> no, it wasn't something that was innately in me. Because, you know, my life, to a certain extent, in the early days, was driven by fear. Yeah. So fear does two things. It either keeps you where it's like you're the, the rabbits in the headlights, mm -hmm. or um, it means that you're constantly, you know, looking, mm -hmm. you know, looking yeah. over your head. You just, you know, so yeah. both of those states are not good. And so... It's about recognizing that fear was an important element, a part of our evolving as human beings. Yeah. Because you know, Survival. if there's a goddamn yeah. tiger running after <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you got to yeah. have something that then sort of gets the adrenaline mm. to sort of go. And so, it, fear, which would have been appropriate back in the day, is no longer appropriate in today's society. Yeah. So it, it's a bit like we have to recognize there's elements of our involvement that's still with us that doesn't serve us well. Mm -hmm. And we have to put a lot of time and effort into keeping it at bay yeah. because it's no longer relevant yeah. in the society. And it's acknowledging and noticing that it is there and actively working on it. Yeah. But the whole of our society is geared towards fear. Mm -hmm. You switch on the news. It's everything that you you look at our society, whether that's the news, whether that's television, whether mm. it's the news. 
it's all geared about fear. Yeah. Whether it's the banking system, every single thing of our modern day society is tapping to that one element of that human nature, which is fear. fear. And that is what then cripples. Now, if you go to countries like India mm. or any developing countries where death and you mm. know the things that we yeah. fear is around you all the time, there is a great, they're, they're not as fearful as we are in the West. Mm. There is a far more, and that's why you feel people, find people in the West wanting to go there and live in those countries because yeah. with death and misery around you all the time, mm. people have a very um, positive approach to life. Mm. And that is because they put it into context. They have a much better context than, than we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's part of what we have to sort of learn is that our fear are created. And it's not only created within us, but it's stimulated by the yeah. society that we live in. And so you have to be able to shut yourself up from it. And don't listen to the shit. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. listen to the shit. And there's so much of it out there. Yeah. And then if you if you if you belong to that, if you listen to it, you'll then be trapped by it. Mm -hmm. Most no, definitely. I mean, even something simple as starting off this podcast, because I'm only 11 episodes in, but just to get our first episode out there and clicking that initial button to send it out to the world, it took me ages to do it. Yeah. I was sitting on the first episode for weeks on end and my, my friend who I recorded the first episode with, he kept on calling me up saying, Francis, have you released it yet? Have you released it? I'm like yeah i'm coming <laughs> but i was just scared and now looking back at it after all the feedback i received when i initially started and now looking back at it, i'm thinking what was i really afraid of mm. was it judgment was it other people's opinions that don't really matter was it what people were saying when i weren't even there to even take heed of whatever it is they were saying but it was crippling nonetheless but once i overcame that initial barrier it felt good then i went into a different sphere now wanting to then push it and elevate it to the next stage but it's like hindsight is one of those things that if i well, knew what, what, what you just described is that so you're at the state of fear mm. and some people at the state of fear would never press that button yeah something in you had to overcome that fear to Most press definitely. that button yeah. so that is what we have to recognize is that fear never goes away mm. you've always got to overcome it Most and definitely. you had the courage to overcome it yeah. and that's what it is is that You'll never get mm. to a state where you're not fearful. You'll always be in a state. We always will be in a state of fear. Mm. And what it is, we have to recognize we're always going to be challenged to overcome it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a daily battle yeah. that we have to understand that you know, we either allow it to take hold mm -hmm. or we push it at bay. Amazing. Really. What would you say to a young aspiring entrepreneur coming up? So if someone has an idea or they have a vision or a talent and they want to push it, well, what I would say to any young person with any idea is this, is that we live in an age where it's full of bullshit, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you buy the bullshit, you will just be living in your head, you know, living a dream in your head that any, any success is about hard work. Mm -hmm. And the way you measure whether you're on the right track is by what are you doing differently to the people around you? Yeah. If you are driven to do something and they say your friends are going up to the party, you have a choice between whether you go to the party with them or you keep on track in doing the things that you want so to that do. delayed gratification, eh? But Is that delayed gratification? Yeah. What well, is? And I think that's what it is, is that there is a price to pay to be successful. Mm -hmm. You can't have it all. You, 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 entrepreneurialism is about not being normal yeah. and what I tend to find is people they want everything and to be not it's just not you know you have I work Saturdays Sundays I don't you know I work every hour that God sends and I, I do that because I love it because yeah. I want to do it if you're somebody who works um, to live you're never going to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurialism is that it, you live and you breathe it. Yeah. It's all part of what you do. Yeah. And so that is what you have to sort of understand. Entrepreneurialism is not a job. It's mm -hmm. a way of life. It's a way of life, yeah. So it's your day-to-day. -day. Um, so what matters most to you in life right now, apart from your work? Really? Well, what matters yeah. to me most in life is, you know, having nearly died you mm. know that actually when it all comes around to it there's very little that matters mm. no money all of the experiences the only thing that matters is the impact you've had on other people's lives yes, definitely. so in terms of your legacy mm. your legacy is you know how you have helped people on their journey in life mm. and so 
that is something that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. I like to go out and help people to achieve what they want to achieve, and it gives me great gratification. Mm -hmm. And so the more of that that I do, the more that I feel that I'm doing something with my life, yeah. really, in helping people. Mm -hmm. Because I know that where I am today, it's not just down to my efforts, it's down to people going out of their way to yeah. give me a break. And what I say to this is, look, the trick in life, actually, is find your guardian angel. Okay. Those people who are going to go out of their way to give you a break, mm. that will then help you on your um, journey in life. Yeah. Find those people. How there. essential is that to find that person or those individuals <coughs> that will help you? Well, we all them. have them. We all have them. And I just think that, you know, if you... And they come to you when you put it out there, there about yeah. this is what you want to do. Because yeah. lots of people have ideas of things they want to do, but they keep it in their heads. In their head. yeah. Again, what I talk about in the book is that you part of starting to talk about it, you're making yourself vulnerable. You're putting yourself on the line. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of stuff you need to do yeah. for the people to help you to come along. Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to get help unless people know about it. And yeah. they're only going to know about it unless you're prepared to talk about yeah. it. That's the first stage that people are going to get mm -hmm. to go out and talk about it. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed how somebody, oh, well, I know so-and-so. Oh, I know so oh, maybe try this. Yeah, most definitely. Put it out there. Yeah, amazing. So it's putting out there in the universe and yeah. ensuring that your voice is being heard because then the opportunity might come and your guardian angel might put you in that position. Exactly. So w why is it so important of, to have that guardian angel? Is it not something that most people can do on their own or it's just the way that this is, this stuff is set up and things are set up? <coughs> <coughs> relations to success and business you could never ever achieve anything in life on your own yeah that will never ever happen mm -hmm. because the reason why you need people you need them to challenge your idea you need them to um to inspire the key thing about us being as human beings is that it's other people that allows us to be the best we can be yeah you'll meet two types of people People who help you to be the best you can be and other people who want to drag you down to yeah. their level because <laughs> yeah. they don't have the courage to do what you're doing. Yeah. So I call those people the fear mongers. Mm -hmm. you know, beware of the fear mongers. You know, yeah. The ones who are going to say, you know, yeah. think you're too big for your boots, think you're stepping above That's above impossible yourself. to do, yeah. You know, yeah. Those people are people who are you know, dead in the, in the water. You know, go for the people who are going to drag you up to be the best you can be yeah thank you that's amazing i mean i know you're a busy man and you've got lots on today but um i really like to first of all thank you and appreciate the time that you've given me today it's it's been of extreme value even the short mm -hmm. amount of time that i've spent with you here today and i'm going to go back and revise a lot of what you said and thank implement you. it in my own life and i hope that my viewers are able to then and my listeners are able to then implement it in their life because i mean i'm trying to appeal to a lot of young people and motivating them and giving them inspirational content that they can take and sort of help improve their own lives and before we leave is there anything that you would like to say anything that you got up and coming or any advice that you would like to give any of my viewers what what i would like to say is first of all you know good on you to get me yeah. is about persistence and yeah. you took a chance Definitely, you know yeah. you, you yeah. took a chance i was actually shocked that you responded so quickly <laughs> oh, yeah but you see you yeah. never know you just never know so that so the fact that you're here at my flat in london doing an interview you know and i say no to a lot of people yeah so it goes to show that, you know, it is worth taking a chance. Yeah. And that, you know, and you do put the work, you put the work in. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's anything I could say to young people, put the work in. And, uh, you know, if you're a black person, especially in our mm -hmm. society, to achieve anything, you're going to have to put the work in. Yeah. You're going to have to be better than, you know, your white counterpart. Mm -hmm. And that, you know unfortunately that's the way it is at the moment but we're pathfinders you know we are our parents those of us whose parents came over in the 50s they were the pathfinders to to come here in the first place it's our responsibility as a second and third generation to branch out into other areas with that's confidence definitely. to feel as though we belong yeah. and 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 not feel trapped that there's only certain things that we could do that's definitely yeah, breaking out of that comfort zone is essential to me because I feel like our focus has always been on the same things like coming from an African household most African households is either you're a doctor or a lawyer but no one really knows any other professions that make sense to them so it's just exploring those other avenues because there's so many different avenues to success now so many different avenues to happiness where you can put your efforts and passions into so yeah really you see, but you see, and back in the day 
that was the thing. So if you're any immigrant family, you know, mm. become one of the elite professions, doctors, lawyers, yeah. that will not be relevant in the future. That, yeah. Because let's put it this way. A, doc a doctor is just a computer. You can now mm. go onto Google. <laughs> do so the diagnosis. Yeah. Do diagnosis. And I, I, I do talks when I say, it, we're going to get to a time in my lifetime where nurses will be more important than doctors. Yeah. Because nurses are the ones who've got to care for mm -hmm. you, who've got to be that that one-to-one -one contact that yeah. we talked about. You know, a doctors, barristers, accountants—all they are is sophisticated machines. Yeah, the machines are now better. You know, just mm -hmm. look at the age that we live in. You know, now when I'm talking to somebody on the phone, I'm talking to a fucking computer. Yeah, yeah, you pretty know? much most of the time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To get you to a human, you've pressed about thirty keys on your phone. Exactly. You know? And men, that human being will be in the Philippines yeah. or, or in South Africa. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's there. It's yeah. telling you what the future is. And yeah. the people who don't see it are the ones who are going to be left behind. Most definitely. Yeah. And the ones who just think, actually, I'm just going to be myself are the ones who are going to own the future. Those who are content with being part of the conceptual age. Ideas, thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. That is the future. Amazing. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you.